I think folks are still coming in, so we'd like to welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this uh, late afternoon. Um, I'm Grace Rue. I'm the Associate Director of the East Asian Study Center, and we're very pleased and excited to have this panel um, with us today. Uh, this is part of our Race Solidarity Series, Trans-Pacific Conversations. And today we're going to talk about the intersections of Asian and Black cultures in theater. And so uh, without further ado, I'm just gonna hand it over to our moderators. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. Welcome everyone to the USC East Asian Studies Center in association with East West Players and the Black and Latino Playwright Celebration um, conversation on the intersections of Asian and Black cultures in theater. As Grace mentioned, it's part of the Race and Solidarity Trans-Pacific Conversation Series here at USC. Uh, my name is Snail Desai and I'm the Producing Artistic Director of East West Players and one of the moder moderators for today's conversation. And welcome, my name is Eugene Lee. And I, am the, and I am artistic director for the Black and Latino Playwrights Celebration at Texas State University. So let's intro our panelists. First, we have Philip Gotanda, American playwright, professor of theater, dance and performance studies at UC Berkeley. Philip has been a major influence in the broadening of our definition of theater in America. Through his plays and advocacy, Mr. Gotanda has, in, has been instrumental in bringing stories of Asians in the United States to mainstream American theater, as well as to Europe and Asia. The author of one of the largest canon of Asian American themed work, Mr. Gatanda is a seminal figure in the field of Asian American drama. Mr. Gatanda's plays are studied and performed extensively at universities, colleges, and learning institutions in the United States and abroad. We, mel we welcome you, sir. Thank you for having me. Also with us is Elizabeth Wong, an American playwright, director, and theater producer. Elizabeth Wong's work includes Letters to a Student Revolutionary, Dating and Mating in Modern Times, Code of Conduct, A Soldier's Awakening to Guantanamo, Tam Tran Goes to Washington, and China Doll, a sensual fantasia inspired by the life of movie icon Anna Mae Wong. She's been awarded the Tain Foundation Grant for Artistic Achievement, the Jane Chambers Playwriting Award, and the Kennedy Center's David Mark Cohen National Playwriting Award. Ms. Wong was a Disney Writing Fellow, a Los Angeles Time op-ed columnist, and writer for the ABC sitcom All American Girl, starring Mar Margaret Cho. Currently, she teaches theater at Boston Conservatory, Berkeley. Welcome. Welcome, and then I have the pleasure of introducing um, Valina Hasu Houston. Valina's uh, literary career began off Broadway at Manhattan Theater Club uh, and then expanded globally. A playwright and musical theater librettist, she also is a published poet, essayist, journalist, blogger, screenwriter, and novelist with over 28 writing commissions. Um, she has been honored by the Kennedy Center, the Smith Smithsonian Institution, Rockefeller Foundation, Japan Foundation, Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, uh, Theater Communications Group, Wallace Foundation. Uh, she founded the Graduate Playwriting Studies at uh, the School of Dramatic Arts here at USC, uh, where she is also a distinguished professor uh, of, and the director of dramatic writing. Uh, and a resident playwright. Um, she is also, uh, she also is uh, on the faculty with the USC, um, I believe it's uh, Yvonne or Yvonne uh, Young Academy. Um, she's a Fulbright scholar, served on the State Department's Japan US Friendship Commission for six years, and her archives are at the Huntington Library in the Library of Congress. Belina serves on the Director's Lab West Advisory Council as well. So welcome to everyone. I would also thank Valina for bringing us all together for this conversation. So uh, why don't we just launch into the, uh, the, some of the questions that we have um, and then we'll open it up to a Q&A in a little bit. So um, the first question we wanna put out there is why did you write your play um, or plays that uh, deal with both the Asian and the black experience and what has been its impact with regard to racial intersectionality? Um, and so maybe also each of you can introduce some of the works that uh, the intersectional works that you have uh, created and then talk a little bit more about the impact. Okay. 
start. Um, so thank you so much for your welcome. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, so I wrote this play called Kimchi and Chitlins, and it's about a, uh, uh, a very new reporter, uh, television reporter, who um, is of Chinese ancestry. And she gets sent out to do a story that a volatile event. Um, that event happens to be the black boycott of the Korean stores uh, in Brooklyn, New York. Um, and so one of the reasons why I wanted to write the play uh, basically was because, um, well, most of the conversation about race in America is mostly, has been binary, you know, between uh, uh, black Americans and white Americans, well, black and white. And so it was really interesting to me to explore um, the other people who are in the community, including, you know, um, the Koreans and uh, Haitians, and to be able to differentiate between, so oftentimes we're all lumped together. And so uh, I wanted to kind of explore how, uh, even though we all may uh, look alike, that the Korean history and their history with um, white people and their Korean history and their history with uh, Chinese and Japanese is different. And same thing with in, in my play, um, a Haitian woman goes into a store and it's a mystery about what happens to her um, because as an outgrowth of what happens to her, um, there's a protest. And so she's Haitian and I wanted to explore, uh, you know, the diaspora of uh, uh, different types of uh, Black Americans and in her case, Caribbean American who, um, uh, the other immigrants that live in the community that I'm a part of. Um, so I wanted to expand beyond the binary. Yeah, so that's only a partial answer to your question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, why don't we, uh, and, and I think it, it, feel free also to respond to each other um, or riff off anything, but why don't we go to uh, Valina? Sure. Um, well, I am Japanese and black. And so often my, so my, the lens that I write through is, uh, is a bicultural lens. So for me, uh, I guess my most popular play is a play called T, which I wrote back in 1982, and which uh, which is amazing to me, continues to, to be produced every year and studied around the world, uh, even though at the time I wrote it, having a play that had five Japanese female immigrant characters was uh, certainly uh, not close to the norm at all in terms of, of what was being what was being presented on the theatrical scene. So uh, I wrote that play, and the Japanese women in it are married to men of different uh, races so that we see not an Asian American landscape or an Asian landscape or a Japanese landscape or a black American landscape. We actually see all of those ethnicities intersecting. And I often find in uh, the theater that, that there is an Asian American narrative or an African American narrative or a Latinx narrative they, they are monoracial narratives, but not very often do you see those um, uh, ethnicities intersecting in one cultural narrative. And if we do see it, it's usually, you know, as Elizabeth said, it's the binary of black white, or we see uh, Asianness with whiteness or Latinx with whiteness, but we rarely see the Asian or Asian American uh, cultural narrative intermingled with the Black American narrative, and just Blackness in general, because, you know, as Elizabeth said, I mean, Blackness is, is very diverse. The, the author, Isabel Wilkerson, says um, there are no Blacks in Africa. There are only Nigerians and Ethiopians and Somalians, and, you know, and there also are no Asians in Asia. There are Japanese, Korean, Chinese, Vietnamese, you know, and so on and so forth. So I think that we're still kind of on the brink of exploring uh, narratives in many fields that that look at Asianness uh, intersected with with blackness in a positive versus negative conflicting light. Great, thank you, Valina and Philip. Um, I've been writing about the the intersection of black and Asian cultures uh, actually from the beginning. Um, 
I have a play called The Wash. I have a play called Johan, a play called After the War. After the War is an interesting kind of moment where in San Francisco, uh, as well as in LA and a little bit, I think in Chicago, at the time of the Japanese American internment, um, when the Japanese and Japanese Americans were imprisoned, uh, it created a vacuum in their neighborhoods. And as in San Francisco, as is the case, persons of color, marginalized peoples that lived in the same neighborhood. So in San Francisco, you had the Fillmore and uh, Western Edition District, uh, which is predominantly African-American, Black American. Japanese were in prison, taken away. They were gone for three, four years. And in that time period, the Black community, as well as other peoples, move into the old Japantown and start their own community, a vibrant community of music, jazz, blues, and so the Japanese Americans get out and they come back and they want the neighborhood back. And I thought that's one of those really interesting moments about intersection. And it happens at a moment too when both are very much um, dislocated and not thought of as Americans. Um, Black Americans have come back from the war and they're not allowed to uh, be buried in the same cemeteries. They're losing all their jobs at the uh, shipbuilding yards and they're giving away to white folks. Um, and the Japanese don't even know if they're Americans. They've just been imprisoned. Uh, and so that kind of intersection to me was kind of inherent conflict interests me. And it also interests me in that how does, uh, how do marginalized peoples on the margins uh, contend with each other as they're both being subjected to systemic racism and how that manifests itself amongst each other as opposed to simply responding to the white center. Uh, the, the play that I'm most well known for is Johan. And like Polina, <laughs> we might have written them about the same time. And they both, I think, might have gone through the same kind of journeys of it's not a white black play. It's a white Asian, a black Asian play. And what do we do with that? Um, mm -hmm. It was originally done uh, East West Players. Thank you, Mr. Desai. And uh, Roby Theater Company. It's uh, Danny Glover's theater company. And Ben Guillory is the artistic director. And uh, Danny was actually instrumental in making sure that the piece was produced. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the history really quickly of the piece, because it explains sort of the trajectory of, I think, uh, American theater's interest in these particular issues. I first wrote the piece as a commission for, uh, I don't know if I even should, yeah, why not? Louisville Theater Company. <laughs> and I thought at the time, I was interested in this idea of an interracial marriage, which was not an uncommon thing. And Valina has written about it extensively the idea of a black GI married to a Japanese woman. And I had several friends who were uh, biracial children of that kind of a marriage. And so I decided to write about it. This was, I think around 1981 or 82, I'm not sure, but I wrote this play and I was excited about it. I sent it off to the theater company. And in response, I got a short little letter which said, thank you very much, we're not interested. That was nothing more and I thought, well, this is kind of weird. Then about four years later, I got a phone call. I got a phone call from the person who had commissioned the play from me. And the phone call said, uh, basically, hey, Philip, we came across a new play of yours. Um, it's called Johan, and we're interested in doing it. And I thought, wow, this is really interesting how the cultural landscape changes and so now that was much more kind of acceptable to have them do the play. Um, when I first was going to do it, I was gonna do it at Berkeley Rep, but I pulled it from the season after it was announced. And that was because at that time, and I think everyone's familiar with this, that can a Asian yellow man write a play that has black characters? And that used to be, that was a big thing and still is. Can I authentically do that? And I was so concerned about it that I pulled the play. Subsequent to that, Danny Glover 
came across it, really liked it, and began to push it. And it's because of Danny Glover and Roby Theater Company and the uh, East Plus Players. And uh, most recently, they've had June Angel in it, I want to say that. Um, because of that, the play was allowed to have a life. And I think, but for that, it would have had a much more difficult journey. Again, because it wasn't with the, the Black White Minor, with someone like Danny Glover, who took interest and pushed it along. And uh, it also, again, speaks to, I thought about this, Danny Glover comes from like the same generation that I do, which is kind of the third world. And as a consequence, his kind of thinking perhaps lent it more to being interested in a story that had these two groups in it, which comprised two thirds of the third world movement back then. But I just thought that was an interesting trajectory on that. Really insightful. You know, I, I, I'll throw in an interesting story. I've, I've not written about blacks and Asians, but I have a play titled East Texas Hot Links, which was done at the public theater in, 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 in New York. And I happen to be standing behind a curtain outside where the people were waiting to audition, right? And they didn't know who I was or, or that I was there. And these young guys were like, man, I had to come see who this Chinese guy is that's writing about black people. My name is Eugene Lee. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. I mean, that kind of thing, yeah. Yeah, but that, those, kind, those kinds of concerns. But I, I guess I have a, I, I a follow-up kind of question, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, if, if, you, if you could speak to the challenge in this endeavor of landing on the intersectionality of these two cultures in terms of our, our, story, our, our storytelling. I mean, can you speak to, how do I say this? I've had black, black playwrights say to me that they were told that they had to include white people in their plays or, or they wouldn't be produced. Uh, I mean, I will say that that years ago, this is probably 20 years ago, I had several theater companies, I won't name any of them, but several theater companies asked me to make the five Japanese women in tea white women, uh, European wow. war brides. And, uh, and it was, uh, bless her, Olympia Dukakis, the actress Olympia Dukakis said, uh, don't let them do that to you. She had produced tea when she was running the whole theater in New Jersey. And she was a very strong advocate of, of people looking at different narratives that didn't fit the commercial you know, landscape in American theater. And you know, she herself wasn't, wasn't black, wasn't Asian, but she felt that uh, we needed to expand the narrative. And so I, I do think that you know, Eugene's right, that there was this kind of desire. I mean, actually I've heard it lately because I'm working on a play called Setting the Table which uh, involves um, a uh, black American man who marries a Japanese female immigrant. And then after he passes away, she has to contend with being step a stepmother to two black American children. Um, along the way, as I've developed this piece, there were many people who said to me, well, could these be white people? And, um, and I knew families like that. And of course I have a lot of friends who are Asian and white. So I tried to think about doing it in that way for a long time, but then um, Olympia's voice was whispering in my ear <laughs> and, and I said, no, my immigrant experience is different. Doesn't make it right or wrong, it's just different. And so I pulled the play back in and went to work with it in the immigrant world that I know, which quite naturally intersected blackness with Asian-ness. It, it's, it, it's, uh, it, if someone can speak to, I mean, I have in my life experience, the compromises that we make in our storytelling, with regard to those kinds of those kinds of things, and 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 is 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 focusing on the common denominators a cop out, or is cultural specificity the first rule? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. uh, Elizabeth, did you want to address that or? No, you've, you you okay. go ahead, Philip. Um, you know, early on, my sense was always that you had to go and simply tell the details, the truth of details of, of your life or a character's life. And that ultimately became cultural specificity. And that that illuminates the whole structure of the world by making sure all the minutia of how people talk to each other, how they don't talk to each other, 
the silences that are contained, what issues are hot, what issues are not. The cultural specificity to me is everything. And people have already said that, the idea that, you know, to be universal, you become culturally specific. And I think that that is the truth of it. You know, there's no other way to do it. <clears throat> and especially if you buy into kind of the bigger common denominator, <clears throat> you're, you're basically saying, well, given that there's systemic racism and institutionalized racism, that bigger picture ultimately is whose picture, you know, whose is it as opposed to being able to tell your own story. Yeah, I, I also have heard people say to me, in fact, my play East Texas Hot Links is, has, has no white characters in it. And I've had, I've had white actors say to me, you, you, you know, Jim, when are you gonna put some white actors in your plays? And and uh, and and I used to say when uh, what's that boy's name in New York? Uh, uh, oh, this film director uh, that was molesting his kids. Uh, but anyway, when Woody Allen, when Woody Allen put some black people in one of his movies, I'll put some white people in my plays. I, 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 what what I think I want to ask is, is oh God, I lost it. I had a note. I had a note. There, there was something about. There's an, there's an interesting intersectionality between Black and Asians that involves three letters, and that's war, hmm. if you know what I mean. And, 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 and that impact on the storytelling. Uh, I, I know it impacts Valinas, you know, uh, you know and, uh, along those lines, but it's, it's, it's interesting to me how, how these cultures still do find a way to dance together, you know, uh, in a wonderful kind of way. Oh, that's not what I was going to ask, though. Yeah, can you explain more what you mean uh, by war, Eugene? Or I, 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 I think mean, I, I, I'm sorry. No, I was going to take a riff. I was going to take a stab at your uh, question, Eugene. Um, let's see if I can remember. Uh, so I think the war is manufactured. I think in my case, it, with Kimchi and Chitlin's case, which was uh, a war between... Uh, uh, black protesters and Korean bodega store owner, um, that the war started when uh, a certain segment of society said, look how hard those Asians work. Uh, the model Asian, the, 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 they're not lazy. Uh, look how they advance and they have ownership of stores in this community. Why don't black, uh, why aren't there any black store owners, black owned businesses, um, blacks are lazy. I mean, this uh, narrative uh, invented in my, in my belief, invented by a white America to pit one another against each other, the races against other races against each other to keep us involved in the squabble. And while uh, in my play, I explore some things about how culture uh, has also caused misunderstandings, like for Asian cultures to touch somebody's hand when you accept money is considered an insult or to look them directly in the eyes considered an insult. But for uh, the American culture, Black America, they might find that if you're not touching me on my hand or, or looking me directly in the eyes, that that is an affront, that I'm being fronted, <laughs> I'm being dissed because uh, of these cultural differences, uh, maybe uh, the war. So I think the war is at a one level being created so that uh, races are pitted against each other. And also there's a war uh, of misunderstandings because culturally we're different than some people. I mean, I'm Chinese American, uh, I'm not Korean, but, um, and to another point that you made Eugene or another discussion, I just wanted to add that, um, you know, uh, the most, uh, most of the time um, Chinese, uh, um, you know, Asian cultures, they um, don't speak up. And it was very unusual that this Korean uh, culture knew how to speak up because they had had uh, contact with uh, Americans uh, through the war. So, so, so they, they were just uh, stepping up because they already knew how to interact, uh, if that makes sense. So um, hence, I think that, uh, you know, in, 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 this, in my play, in that sense, um, 
uh, the, Korea, the Korean culture already had this kind of contact with American culture, Black America intermarried with them and as uh, Philip and Galena's play uh, so beautifully uh, explore. Um, I didn't, uh, I, 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 they had done it so beautifully. So I was just interested in what is what about a gal in the workplace trying to make sense of this volatile event and, uh, and responding to real life events. Because back in uh, 1990, there was an incident between a Haitian a woman immigrant who went into a Korean store and tried mm. to buy plantains and limes and it turned into a crazy shoving match. And from there, it escalated. And so I was watching the news coverage thinking, what the heck? Because every time I saw more coverage, I only saw the protester side. I never heard the Korean side. And I wondered, um, in a weird way, I wrote the play as an apologia for my old former profession because I had been a journalist and I kind of know the process of what it's like to be flung in the middle of a uh, crazy event and trying to make sense of it so that you can uh, explain it to other people. And so, so um, you know, trying to also talk about how the media uh, works to create that war that you're sort of talking about because um, uh, they don't, because they don't know the language skills enough to go talk to the Koreans. So my play explores all the pitfalls that the uh, media uh, and its responsibility in inflaming events. So, which we have seen uh, very recently. And that's expanded with social media. I mean, you know, I mean, oh, I, yeah. Philip said something early on, which I think speaks to this notion of what is war because you know, Philip was talking about the fact that when Japanese Americans came out of the forced incarceration camps, uh, they found you know, black Americans living in uh, their former neighborhoods. And so a kind of war or if you will, tension was created. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the things we often, well, I don't think we forget it. It's just the way that you know, the racial structure in America, I guess, but, but we forget that often the source of that hatred is the same source for all groups of color. That, that, that the same uh, hatred that would have pushed Japanese Americans into forced incarceration is the same hatred that black Americans had felt because of, of uh, being enslaved and dealing with Jim Crow laws and, and the rigors of the civil rights movement. So here you have you know, oppressed people uh, pushed into warring against each other when in fact the sources come from the same source for all of them. And, and that's kind of sad. And, and I feel that when I go to see theater, and this is true actually if it's a black American play or an Asian American play or a play like Johan or Kim Chi and Chitlins where I'll see both worlds represented, that I think uh, that that narrative of conflict is there. And, and for me, the hope is to move towards uh, either looking at anti-blackness in the Asian American culture or looking at anti-Asianness in the black American culture and trying to move beyond that that narrative by exposing it and reflecting upon it through art. You know, I can speak to the love that comes out of that conflict though. Don't they? Ask, uh, say the question again, I'm sorry. It seems that your plays in particular speak to the love that comes out of that conflict. Oh. Well, because I'm trying to look for the the positive, because often people will say to me, I don't get it, you know, Japanese and black people seem like the most different people on the planet. How could they ever be in the same room together? I'm thinking, hmm, you know, now I certainly don't have all the answers, but I do know uh, that I've seen many uh, Asian black marriages and relationships of different kinds and been able to experience that positivity firsthand. So for me, it's important to find, to not shy away from the, the, the conflict and tension that, that inevitably is there in any human relationship, but also to look at you know, uh, the positive aspects that I know um, can exist because love, as we all know, it sounds pat, but love has no color. You know, it just simply doesn't. If I can talk a little bit about those, those, all those different ideas there, they're quite interesting. And I have a play called after the war, which I talked about. And it was at the core about a friendship between a black man and Japanese American man. And my whole thesis ultimately was that it takes place in 1945. There's not a lot of information around yet. People, again, don't know how to 
intellectually understand racism. And, they, and even though my characters talk about the man and all around them, they're acknowledging that there's this bigger white dominant culture that's imposing everything on them that makes them act the way they act. In the end, they can't get beyond what's been imposed upon them and that they find that they cannot be friends anymore. That the pressures are such that in the end, there's not enough information. And in 1945, the black man and, and the yellow man look at each other and says, uh, I'm going my way, you're going yours. After they've gone through this whole thing of, of comparing their kind of you know, suffering together, they, they look at each other and go like, I'm going my way, you go yours, and that's it. And they both leave. And that speaks to my own personal kind of interest in, the, in looking at how these conflicts um, are so fraught with so many different things that it's not easy to ever bridge them. And in my particular piece after the war, they don't. And I thought for me, that was kind of a, a realistic way of how I looked at the situation. Um, I also have this little, I'd like to move it into another. Eugene. Go, I have a question about those two, about those two soldiers I think you just talked about, right? Mm -hmm. they're, that went, yeah. their, went their own ways. Mm -hmm. But were they changed at all? Uh, yes, they, they actually understood more, I think, about the idea of that each of them carries seeds of kind of a racial, a racism. And that because of that, and they don't yet know how to acknowledge that or see beyond it, ultimately that's what defeats the friendship. Which is, which is, again, that area of interest of mine in terms of marginalized peoples. And it also gets to a question I have for all the playwrights here. You know, we live in a new time. It's Black Lives Matter. Uh, there's so much going on in the world. Uh, African Black uh, American issues are foregrounded as they should be. We're trying to, as it were, kind of change the course of a whole society a history of racism. And so I'm looking at it from the standpoint of, I am an Asian American man who's written about these things, uh, an interracial marriage, uh, the neighborhood in San Francisco, and the world has changed and shifted. So now when I go back and look at those works, I'm wondering, you know, whose point of view is it? Who's in the center? And did I do justice in terms of actually telling the whole story or was it skewed by at that time, my lack of or ability to see in toto, no matter how much work I did on the piece, the other side. And I, I really am in a quandary now as to what is the positionality of Asians in relationship to uh, black America, African-Americans, uh, and that how can I, if I wanted to write a story that was inclusive of both cultures, how do I approach it? Uh, or do I, in the end, have to say, I can write about my point of view in, that talks about the relationship that my community has with this other group and tell that because perhaps to try to tell it in toto at this point in time, again, there's, there's too much swirling around right now, and perhaps rightfully so, the African Black American story, African American story should be more foregrounded and perhaps tilt more in that direction. Rightfully so, again, I say tilt, but it's just again, a, when a story goes out there now, how will it be looked at? And I'm not, for me, this has been a big thing that I've been thinking about. I'm kind of curious about other folks are, I don't know how to write that story anymore without it perhaps being misinterpreted or thought of as being uh, proprietary or shortchanging the, the perspective of the black American characters. Uh, and I, I find that again, looking back at my old work too, to look through that lens of where we are now, it, it, it causes me to re-examine everything I've written about those particular issues. And I'm curious as to what mm. Elizabeth and Belina have they thought about this or? I mean, I don't think you should. I mean, if, if well, with regards to your past plays, um, they are artistic 
snapshots of that particular period in time and whatever the political landscape was at that time. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I would think that you must think of those as important you know, artistic expressions of that time and, and that they shouldn't be judged through the lens of the political landscape that exists today, right? Mm -hmm. I do hear a lot of um, you know, younger playwrights saying, well, if you're not from that ethnicity, you know, then how can you represent it on stage, you know? Yeah. And I listen to what they have to say, and I'm sure, you know, Philip, you hear that at UC Berkeley and, and, and you hear it in Boston, you know? And the thing is, I think that artists, well, first of all, we're dealing with theater, which is the suspension of disbelief, right? Mm -hmm. And I think each one of us we have our own lived experience and you know we don't know the world doesn't know what that is i mean for instance when growing up i had a great deal of exposure to the german immigrant experience i haven't written about it but i understand philip that if i did today someone would say wait you know you're not german how dare you <laughs> right but i just feel as artists that we have to express the world's through our lens and our own sets of experiences and it's, you know, full speed ahead down the torpedoes. I agree because I don't think we ever know when we're giving someone new information, if that makes sense. And I think people don't change until they get new information. And, and, and a prime example, I did a play on Broadway a couple of years ago called American Son uh, with Kerry Washington and, 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 and Jeremy Jordan and, and Stephen Pasquale, four of us. And she was a black mother in the, in, in the, in the police station at three o'clock in the morning trying to find out what happened to her son. And audience after audience after audience responded to that play with, I never knew that about a black mother's plight, which means new information, which means that's when what we do has healing power, I think, I, I, I really do. And that's not a question, it's just a statement, I guess, it's <laughs> more than anything, just to follow up on, 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 what you, on, on what you guys have been talking about. And, and just the whole phenomenon about not knowing really when we're giving new information to, to an audience with what, we, with what we bring. I, every night before I go on stage, whatever it is I'm doing, I say to myself, somebody out there needs what I'm bringing. And, and I think that's a big part of what our responsibility as truth, truth tellers with clarity as best we can and those little gems, they land in places that we never know about a lot of time, I guess. Yeah, I wanna um, chime in on a couple of these things. It, I, I think I, I completely agree with what Eugene and Valina just said. And if nothing else, it's because um, uh, white people really think they can tell the Asian American story and they try over and over again um, to talk, talk about our experiences. I mean, that the, the volume of plays that we receive at East West Players that are by white people about the Asian experience always is it sometimes feels 10 to one, you know what I mean? Um, and, and it's one of those things where as, as folks, people of color, we're much more conscious and aware, um, you know, as we, seek to uh, encounter some a different culture story. I also think there's generational stuff, but uh, Philip, as you were talking, you know, we did uh, a Johan revival at East West Players um, and recently, and it was one of those things where, you know, when I read the play again, it it holds up because the, the racism is still exists between our communities, right? The taboo of an interracial relationship between an Asian um, or Asian American woman and a black man are, are because there isn't a lot of work that oftentimes addresses our communities directly. And I always think about what I always am encouraging writers um, of color to think about is basically the equivalent of the Bechtel test. So I don't know if you all know uh, the Bechtel test, which is can um, you put uh, female or female identified characters together and have them talk about anything but men, you know what I mean? Or reference men. And I think, can we have those conversations where it's not a, a white centeredness in the conversation? Um, because so much of our work is always against, it's against colonialism, right? It's ripping against scarcity models, capitalism, but also a colonial structure that has beat us down. Um, so, you know, I, I think, so I'm curious about how you feel like this moment, you know, each of you has written a seminal work, I would say in the Asian American canon about the experience and, and how now 30, 20, 30 years later, 
you feel those conversations are where they are, if you feel like they're, they've been progressing or not. Um, and, and as you look for, as you, we look forward, what has been missing? You know what I mean? What do you think maybe has not been, we haven't been able to kind of continue the conversation to the, to the next level. I'm curious, um, yeah, about thoughts on that. And I want to tie this question to um, what, you know, some of you have already spoken about what you're working on now, but if there's anything else that you're currently working on um, that deals with um, the relationship between the Black and Asian communities. Uh, before we do that, I, we also want to let folks know they can put questions in the Q&A chat. So um, we're able to see them. So if folks want to go ahead and put questions in there. Um, that'd be great. And we'll move into the Q&A section in a few minutes. Could I ask that question that, that I, that the next question that I had, what do you feel is theater's capacity to illuminate transcultural experience and have an impact on society? Did we do that one already? I think we did. Mm -hmm. I think, so I'm moving to the next one. And mm -hmm. You just asked, are you working on any new plays that explore racial intersectionality? Uh, I have a new play called Code of Conduct, which is about um, an American uh, young man, uh, uh, actually a heavy metal musician, who's a little lost in his life and uh, decides to join up the join up uh, in the army. His first deployment is uh, Guantanamo, and he's a guard. And six months later, he converts to Islam. In this play. Um, uh, not only are there many different cultures, uh, many different um, uh, Middle Eastern cultures coming to bear in this one place, uh, but also the prison, you know, the question asks who's really in prison, the prisoners or the guards or America and uh, the mindset that's uh, stuck in this place uh, during the height of the uh, uh, enhanced interrogation. So, um, one of the things that I was interested in studying was, uh, for myself anyway, is to put some reflection of myself in it. So uh, there is um, a character who's a Uyghur, so a Chinese character who um, was uh, lumped in with all of the terrorists because he is a terrorist, but his enemy is China. So while everyone else is uh, ostensibly their enemy is America, um, here's this one Uyghur character who uh, um, is in the play seeking asylum from the uh, guards. So uh, I find it very difficult to, to market this play. <laughs> no one wants to talk about something that we swept so beautifully under the rug. Um, you know, it's a, it's a tough play to experience. That's why I probably uh, wrote it as a 90 minute play. So there's no intermission. So once I have you, if you're willing to sit with me, but I hope I have just uh, found a way to, um, you know, explore uh, our human ability to survive even in the most trying and most difficult and horrific of times. I think that's possible. I think we're living in it, a very horrific uh, time yeah, for everyone in our in the last couple of years. But also historically, we've lived through a horrible time and, it, it, and this uh, specter of racism uh, rears its head. It comes and like, you know, uh, Emmett Till and then goes back underground. And then here comes, you know, Kimchi and Chitlin was written around uh, the time of uh, Rodney King. Um, in fact, it had a uh, reading at the Mark Taper Forum the same year as uh, the, the so-called LA uh, uprisings. And it goes back underground and then it resurfaces. So it is a wound that hasn't healed, won't heal, but I am hopeful uh, because it feels different this time that people, uh, thanks to social media, have been able to, uh, with their eyes um, and perhaps with their hearts too, see when someone is uh, weaponizing their whiteness in order to hurt a bird watcher in Central Park. I mean, we hear that and we see it and it's so clear. Or when uh, Capitol protesters uh, get to go home and then we have to chase after them and get they get arrested. Whereas uh, Black Lives Matter, they get sprayed with uh, pepper spray and, um, and tear gas and jailed immediately. So um, we see that with our eyes and we can, and that social media uh, 
helps us see it more personally and more intimately. And if I were to write kimchi and chitlins to get, uh, you know, today, of course, social media would have played a big role in gathering the protesters outside the grocery store. So it is my, I'm so sad that um, my play, which was written in 1990 as a graduate student at NYU, um, still has relevance today. And uh, that to me is, I, I would rather it be uh, a relic. So, um, but yeah, unfortunately, it, a lot of the things I was uh, exploring in that play, including an answer perhaps to the question of how do we solve racism. I see it in when Henry Louis Gates went to have a beer with the police officer who, uh, you know, they were invited by President Obama uh, to have a beer with the guy who, the police officer who tried to arrest him, even though he was trying to, uh, Henry Louis Gates uh, professor at Harvard was trying to break into his own house because he forgot his keys. The answer in my play has always been there, but people never see it, never. And that is that you have to sit down with your enemy and talk, listen, and then, you know, work. So, uh, it's so funny that, you know, people would rather hold on to their anger. And uh, that's the reason why Kimchi and Chitlis is a comedy, because that's my way of, as to me, laughter is medicine. And so, um, but, you know, having written that play, published in 1994, and it's still relevant. It's really a sad thing. The truth is forever. Huh? I mean, yeah. I can. Uh, You're here, Eugene. Yeah. <laughs> Well, go ahead. Would, was someone about to speak? Yeah, yeah, I'd like to. I, you know, I, I understand what everyone's saying in relationship to the idea of wanting to reach across the table and that if we just sit down together and tell the truth, then, then it's a step forward. My feelings are shifting in that uh, the whole idea of these truths that we carry are so in, so informed and impacted by structural systemic racism that that perhaps is not a very good book out by Dr. Luckett, I think, uh, Shear, but it's about, uh, I have it, uh, I had it right here. Basically, it's the idea that, you know, you can't, an African-American, a person of color goes into an acting class and everything about it is structured around kind of a white aesthetic. So how do you begin to allow that actor to gain the skills to tell a story in his, her, or their own way that's based on a historical lineage that supports them in a way that the white history did not. So again, going back to all the various things in terms of what black artists and theater artists did along the way to that moment when you're in the classroom. In fact, how do you teach acting? Um, can you teach Shakespeare without a great deal of contextualization? You know, for me, I, those are the things that I'm being, I ask myself now. Shouldn't be everyone's question, but it stymies me, you know, in terms of, I'd like to believe the things I used to believe, but I find that everything around me tells me that, boy, if the world's really gonna shift, it means it has to go to the institutions. And what does that mean in relationship to if you're a person of color, if you're a mar marginalized person, when the institutions are all about someone else being in the center and you're on the margins. So again, they're teaching from the center and when I go in for an acting class or someone else, a person of color, what and how do they learn in that situation? I can actually, I, oh, Valina. No, no, go go ahead. Oh, I'll just say it really quickly. You know, I teach at um, uh, Boston Conservatory at Berkeley and um, they are beginning to decolonize their uh, core classes. I taught uh, script analysis for the performer and in that, um, class. We also taught Julia Cho's BFE. Uh, I also taught, um, you know, uh, a, a, no, uh, a book, uh, no play 
in the curriculum. Whereas once it was taken up by a Shakespeare play, now there is um you know it's integrated into the core uh, course. So I was actually you know it's the first time it's happened over there, and so I, but I can say that um, it's hopeful sign that. Uh, there's a wokeness and recognition that the time is now to take advantage of the opportunity to make it right. So um, now it's a question of balance because I, I don't want to throw out Thornton Wilder, whom I love, or Tessie Williams, whom I love, but I also want to add in, you know, uh, Luis Alfaro. So I'm going to teach Greek theater. I'm also going to put in Mojado or, or uh, Oedipus El Rey. Do you see what I'm saying? So, so I think that's happening, Philip, I think. And probably, happening at, is it happening at Berkeley? It's happening at the other Berkeley on the other coast. It's happening at Texas State. Mm -hmm. I have a, we, we do workshops every year. In fact, Galena has been down here for the workshops. And this past year, we did a, a new play called Greenwood, which is about the Tulsa, Oklahoma uh, riots and raids. And the director that came down, and these are workshops. And my knowledge of no theater is very limited. But she, she came, and this was just a reading, and, and she, intersectionality, once again, she took this play about some black people in Oklahoma 100 years ago, and she infused some of the elements of no theater into this reading. And the one that I really kind of remember best is multiple, multiple actors playing the same character that, that, that you know, and, and just in terms of what it, what it gave to the storytelling of that moment, of that event, it was clarity in a strange kind of way. I thought it wouldn't work. I thought, you got five ladies playing this one young girl. I, that's going to be confusing at some point, you know, in the course of this. Mm -hmm. But it was not. It was quite the opposite. It proved most clarifying in a strange kind of way. I, I, I wish I could explain it. I really can't. But once again, intersectionality, uh, 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 genre marriages, you know, of, of, of this sort. Uh, it was interesting to me. I, I, I wanted to rebel against it when she first came. I was like, uh, okay, you can do whatever you want, but, but okay. But it really, it, it really was an interesting choice, I guess is what I'm saying, mm. an active choice. May I say something? I wanted to say, as a mixed race person, I wanted to say this. I feel that 20 years ago and today, something is exactly the same about theater, which is that it's monoracial. So 99% of the time, I'm hired because I'm a Japanese writer, which is fine. I'm not complaining because I am Japanese and I am both, you know, inseparably so. But 1% of the time, I've been hired uh, out of my blackness. And what I found 20 years ago, which I still hear today, is well, you know, I don't know if you can tell, you know, a Japanese story because um, you're mixed and that's coming from Asian Americans. Or then I hear from Black Americans, well, I don't know if you can really tell a Black story because you're mixed, right? Yeah. So it's almost as if my Blackness is diminished and my Japanese-ness is diminished because I'm mixed. And so I still find today in this reality that, uh, for instance, if I go up for a job, if they're looking for a Black writer, I, I remember the great, uh, uh, one of the founders of the Supremes, Mary Wilson, she said to me, she goes, I'm sorry, you're not Black enough for me. You were raised by a Japanese woman. And um, I, mm -hmm. I often hear this kind of thing, and I still hear it, where I'll submit something for someone to read that's looking for someone to write a Black narrative, and they say, no, 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 you know, you were raised by a Japanese woman. You're not going to work for this project. So I still think that we're caught in that notion of, uh, of, of different camps, Asian American theater, uh, Black American theater. And in terms of theater making, I think we still have to, to go to that place where we look at uh, uh, the intersections in the way that Johan does or in the way that Kim Chi and Chitlin does, whatever kind of quote unquote war it is, you know, where there's a friendship and the ups and downs of that, but telling a story where those narratives live, uh, not as an exception, but just as the reality of the story as in, in, in the two plays I just mentioned. You've well, also oftentimes for me, oh, sorry, Lee, oftentimes for me, you know, I hear uh, you're not Muslim, uh, you're not, uh, uh, you know, you're not Middle Eastern, so why are you writing this story? But it is an uh, interesting story for me. I have to do my homework. The more I do my homework, the more, uh, uh, the more I dive into uh, creating a character that is, uh, um, you know, rounded and, and depthful and feeling. Uh, 
hurting. I, I can find, uh, I can find common ground with my characters and therefore I justify uh, writing about them um, as long as I'm not irresponsible about it. I uh, am a writer first and foremost. I want to express what I see in the world and what is um, uh, my concerns in the world. And so I'm writing about um, what happens when, a, you know, uh, what it's like to uh, become a Muslim and, and uh, embrace Islam. Uh, I want to, you know, what the key for that story for me is uh, the notion of spirituality. How does where does a spiritual epiphany come from? And I think that's uh, crossing all kinds of racial lines. So I am not even thinking, you know, I'm thinking more about, about spirituality than I am thinking about um, race. But of course, race, um, because people's uh, spirituality is also weaponized, uh, I'm also interested in, you know, grappling with that. Um, so uh, I have a right, I feel, to write this story as long as I'm respectful and, and, um, you know, raise hell over these uh, subject, uh, difficult subject matter in a way that, um, you know, that's the reason why comedy for me is uh, kind of like this, uh, this uh, slip and slide that I place all these difficult uh, ideas and I wrap it around, a, uh, a, you know, a confection. So while uh, Code of Conduct is not wholly a comedy, um, you know, it has a lot of music in it. So it helps because uh, I think music also is very healing. So I think that, um, you know, crossing genres and crossing racial lines. Music is the way, I, you know, I learned about the black culture first and it was only, then I became, you know, obsessed about the Harlem Renaissance. So I, you know, you have to educate yourself. You have to study, you have to do dramaturgy. You have, you know, um, married to its cultural specificity, married to the, the, re the reason you're writing, uh, the, the thing that you're writing. But um, I did wanna, you know, say that, um, you know, I admire both Belina and Philip and Eugene and, and Snehal, oh my gosh, so much. And I don't know, uh, I'm just honored to uh, be in your presence. Um, and uh, I just, and also I wanted to add on to something that Eugene started and Belina just touched on, which is that I have a play called China Doll. It was about, it's about, uh, inspired by the life of Anna Mae Wong. Um, I wrote it a while ago and uh, it had a, reading, first reading at the uh, Mark Taper Forum. And the reason I'm mentioning it is because I've always wanted Marlena Dietrich, um, you know, uh, Douglas Fairbanks, who are all in the play, uh, Irving Thalberg, to be played by Asian people. So I'm having the opposite problem all these years since this play was written. I've only wanted an all Asian cast. And because, um, uh, you know, that's, so my problem is, you know, I want an all Asian cast for a play for, cause I think it's funnier. The arbitra the arbit you know, the arbitration of the fun for me is, is that if all these characters, because they, they've had to play, white people play us in the past in the movies. So I thought I'd turn the tables and without having to talk about racial, uh, uh, racial differences, all you had to do was just have, you know, a, a beautiful Asian person play Marlena Dietrich and then you're done, you know, and it's funny. So, Opposite problem. You know, uh, with that, no, that's that's very interesting to me. I I, I want to throw out a word: villains. Who are our villains in our storytelling? It's it's interesting that I've been told that you know white people sometimes will not support a black play or a play by a black person because they feel like if they go, they're going to be the villains. They're going to be the bad guys. And I my play East Texas Hot Links is about a Judas goat amongst these black people as opposed to making white people the villain, if you know what I mean, that, that, that general thing. Any thoughts on, on, on who our protagonist and who our antagonists are in our storytelling and, and, and how we share those things? Can I expand on that, Eugene? Please, um, man. <laughs> it's, it's kind of Eugene's question adjacent to, and uh, <clears throat> it also relates to this idea of any projects we're working on now. I have this project called the Great American uh, Wash Cycle. And the idea that I have <clears throat> is to take my play, The Wash, which is a kitchen sink Japanese American drama, naturalistic, and adapt it to other groups on the margins as opposed to the center. You know, the idea that 
normally all of us, we adapt from the center. But what if you adapt from the margins to the margins? Does that change the discussion? And so for me, the idea was the wash is a play that um, has an interesting history. It, um, I got a phone call from a friend who lives in Mexico and said, you know what? The wash was made into a movie and said, I'm watching the wash dubbed in Spanish. And I'm going, that's what? Uh, and the idea is that it's a play that perhaps uh, transcends or not transcends, but can shift. So my idea is to present the wash uh, from different uh, points of view. So to have a, an African-American version, a, um, a Latinx version, a Middle Eastern American version. So to see what happens both in the process of that adaptation, what happens as you sit at the table and do the adaptation with everyone being very clear about what's going on. Uh, and then the final product where the audience actually being aware of that this comes from the Japanese American play. And we're looking at this, what finally became a Jamaican American play. Uh, what is that experience and does that have value? Um, so we adapted it to, the, to a, a Jamaican American family because we felt that best after conversations with several folks adapted best to a kind of Japanese American family. Uh, we used Carl Lumley who folks don't know is actually Jamaican. Um, and so there are these parallels with the Japanese American family. Like uh, Carl talks about when he was growing up in Minneapolis, his father said, don't go out and play with the black kids. You know, they're gonna get you into trouble. You gotta, you know, stay amongst your own kind or whatever and study, study, study. Um, so the idea was ultimately, if you do that kind of adaptation and you're very conscious, again, we talked about names, we talked about food, uh, all the things that might go into it. We also talked about dialogue in terms of how people talk to each other. And that's where my, my characters really had, were, were inadequate because they didn't speak as directly. And so we altered that. And my question was, does, is there value in that, doing that for persons of color to get a better sense of each other as opposed to, again, the binary of black and white or white center, uh, is there value in that? And so that's a project I've been trying to do, but has stalled out for lack of interest. <laughs> and perhaps rightfully so, that's one of those things, rightfully so. Uh, but it's something that I've attempted and attempting, again, just for me to figure out a little bit more about margins to the margins, like, is there a way that we could do it theatrically and see something in a theatrical language that gives us some new information, new layering that brings us a little closer than just sitting across the table and saying and saying stuff? It sounds very interesting. I mean, I would think that it would allow different communities of color to compare the similarities, um, you know, in their experiences rather than thinking about each other as different. Mm -hmm. I would think so. <laughs> Why don't we move to some of the uh, questions, Eugene, um, that we've uh, that folks have submitted? Um, I'll start with um, it's a question around a decolonization of theater, so it ties into a little bit of what um, Philip was just talking about. Um, it, the, this is the question. Um, you've mentioned obstacles you face producing plays that center marginalized peoples. How could the language of those peoples be used to combat white supremacy? What obstacles do you face using those languages when theater uh, theaters often cater to directly or indirectly a predominantly English speaking audience? And what advice would you have for newer playwrights of color facing these same obstacles? Well, you want that? Well, I can speak to language because in all my plays, I love languages. I, uh, I, I love the music of, of other cultures' languages. So in Kimchi and Chitlins, there's Haitian, there's in Letters to Sort of Revolution, there's Spanish, um, there's Greek in a Greek play, an adaptation uh, for young audiences called Prometheus. Um, so I think that 
we have, uh, for me, just the use of the language, being able to, context to contextualize it in the telling of the story so that people get, audiences get used to hearing the music and the beauty of a language, that it, all, it may be part of um, the problem, but it also can be, uh, but it's probably because they're unfamiliar with it. So in my plays, I, I do love to put, uh, you know, I have a, a new radio play and I put, uh, uh, Cantonese, Mandarin, Spanish, and Armenian in it, because those are the people whose lives I'm exploring. So it's part of who they are. And um, so I am not, a, I don't shy away from usage of language, but you do have to be uh, a little bit um, uh, sneaky about how you make sure that people understand it within the context of what's going on. So I say, don't be afraid of it that it's a beautiful thing. And it helps to, when people get used to hearing it. I remember listening to a play in De at Denver Center Theater and it was a, a beautiful uh, Caribbean accent and audiences were leaving because they said they couldn't understand it. You know, they, did, they, could, they didn't want to have the patience to sit and listen to the dialect. Even if me, I may not have understood it completely, but letting that beautiful uh, lilt wash over me, um, was just as uh, beautifully experiential as if I understood it, which may I may, you know, some things I did miss, of course. But so I, I guess is that I like to hear put languages uh, and I do it deliberately in my plays. That's an interesting phenomenon. I've heard I don't know how many times from white audiences, we can't understand you, especially in the South. And I actually said to some one little white lady, I said, you know, you know who taught black people English? We didn't know English when we came here. You know who we learned English from <laughs> and you can't understand us? But that's, a, that's, that's, a, that's, oh, I had a point I was gonna make about clarity. And, and, and you talked about, you talked about uh, uh, acclimating an audience's ear to, to the rhythms and to the language and stuff. And that's new information in a wonderful kind of way. And I look at the writers, I look at African-American writers like August Wilson and like myself, and like Shakespeare, who take and elevate this language to poetry, which makes it accessible in an interesting kind of way across cultural lines, if that makes sense. Yeah, uh, it's really my uh, hope that when I put languages in that white audiences, although I'm not all that concerned with them, but at the same time, I know that the effect is they need, I would want them to embrace this as part of their culture too. I've had to embrace their culture uh, you know, all my life. So embrace the, the, you know, embrace my language also, the Toisan that I know that is a dying language. Please know that that belongs to you. It's an American uh, gift because you know these are the people in, in my family who built the railroads and the canals and um, uh, were digging the gold you know uh, 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 teaching how to do uh, terrace farming the Chinese uh, immigrants and so the language of Toisan which um, is happens to be the language that I speak my grandma is a language I hope to to preserve but also to acclimate uh, audiences to embrace it as their own. And they seem to think, oh, I understand Chinese. And that it's brilliant. It's like what Tony Kushner does with polysyllabic words. He makes people feel brilliant because they think, oh, I understood that. I am so smart. <laughs> so it's the same tactic <laughs> for me anyway. I mean, I do use Japanese language in my plays, but I, I find a way in the way in the you know flow of the scene so that the, the context of that, of what they're saying is understood. So even though the, the words may not be understood verbatim, certainly if they're listening to the scene, then they get the meaning of it. And you know, as far as the other part of the question goes, uh, I mean, I do think that with movements like the white, dear white American theater movement and uh, things like that, that we're starting to ask questions about how to decolonize theater. But, um, but at least from what I know, two of us on this uh, panel are, um, Sneha Hall and Eugene are, producers as well as uh, holding other roles in theater. So maybe you two are the best to answer that part of it. Yeah, I, you know, what's interesting is I, I think there has definitely been a shift, particularly in the last five to 10 years. 
And, and my thing is we've been coddling people too much because, you know, just as they say they don't understand um, uh, Elizabeth, um, was it the Haitian accent? They couldn't under, wait, right? You know what I don't understand? Shakespeare, because I have to sit there and my ear has to attune to that language. And those people can attune to Shakespeare. They can attune to very thick Irish accents, right? They can sit through a Dancing at Lunasa or uh, a Connor McPherson play, but yet when it becomes an Asian accent, it suddenly becomes too too much, um, but the and and the other interest and so to me now it's like, but when you go out in the world and you do you understand do you, every word that is spoken around you right like when you walk down the streets of L.A. do you understand every single person uh, you know every other a single language that's being spoken no and that's fine because there's other ways for us to interpret so I would say at Isa's players what's been interesting is we used to be very. Um, cautious, I would say, you know what I mean? We wanted to make sure no one felt left behind. No one, so we were very careful. Do we need to translate this? Do we need a glossary? Do we need to make sure in the scene? And now it's like, you know, there are things that in all of our lives that we don't understand. And that's a part of living. And, and you have to, I think we have to train people to accept that, that you, you shouldn't fear what you don't understand. Um, or, you know what I mean, what, what um, someone else has a different reaction to. And I think the big thing where that's happening is, is when you think about Netflix now, right? Like how many shows do people watch that are in other languages? Um, you know, because that stuff, it's become global in that way so that uh, this French show Lupin recently, you know what I mean? That folks uh, are getting more and more used to that. And I think we just got to we have to hold our audiences accountable because the other thing that they will do is, as Lena was saying about the monoracial aspect is none of us checks off any one box in our life and we don't prioritize say our gender over our cultural culture or being a child of immigrants or sexual orientation. So we need to create spaces that are inclusive to all of those, you know what I mean? Intersectional parts of ourselves. And I think that is what we have not pushed for, right? So that we have culturally specific institutions, we have gender specific institutions, um, and the the places have not allowed for a full, you know, someone to come in as their full self grappling with those issues because people say it's too much, right? It's too many things. Um, but I, I think that's also generational in that every household, you know, if it's not already, is going to be multiracial in this country, you know what I mean, in a generation or two. So those um, fears or those things are, are going to, I think, time out, but we have to talk about them. I think um, two playwrights that I are doing interesting work around that is Young Jean Lee with The Shipment, and I think uh, Leah Nanako Winkler with uh, Two Mile Hollow, because both of those were plays where they upended the white experience by populating the entire play with people of color playing white people. You know, if I can talk about one other playwright who writes, um, I think it's not reactive, but active from her point of view, from her cultural point of view, and that is uh, Mia Chung. She has a play called You For Me For You, and she does something that I think is quite remarkable in that how she contends with, uh, how she expresses the, the difficulty when you come from a language and you come to America and the, the tribulations of that. And what she does is, you know, she writes in English for the Korean characters, we're in America. So she writes them in English. Then the character goes to America and the white American character speaks gibberish. And she's standing there going, whoa, whoa, what's this? But more than that, it's not gibberish. She actually has spent the time to take an American phrase and she has it underneath the gibberish. And she spent the time making sure that all that gibberish is in fact uh, what you might hear if you heard the English. And so what she does is through the course of the play, that gibberish becomes more and more intelligible to the character. So I thought that's a really interesting way of doing it where it's not reactive necessarily, you know, you didn't understand this, what, but rather it's from her point of view as she experienced it being a Korean immigrant. Uh, so I think Mia Chung's play is interesting in how she contends with the issue of uh, language. Viet Gan also does that, Queen of Wins play. Yeah. Also. Uh, Eugene, do you want to read another question? Yes, if I can find, oh, they're here. Let me, let me find it. 
Uh, here's one from an anonymous attendee asking, many of your pieces seem to be era pieces. Have you planned creating new works that have a more modern lens to show contemporary interactions between races? Well, well the, new play, the new play, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say the new play I'm working on is set in 2020, so that's this era. <laughs> <laughs> Is that an issue? Is that is 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 it easier to write twenty twenty than nineteen fifty five? I mean, I see it all as part of the you know the the experience in which each of us lives in this lifetime. I mean, I you know I read things that Arthur Miller wrote when he was you know eighty three years old, and uh, that's actually when he rewrote Death of a Salesman for China. So you know. I, I don't think of them as era plays. I think of them as snapshots of different periods of time. And you know, as some of us have said, many audiences are willing to read plays, you know, written in a different century by Shakespeare, but they won't read a play written, uh, you know, ten years ago by a person of color or a person uh, who is not part of the, you know, European American cisgender mainstream. So, so um, I know for one that. Uh, as I go through my life, it's not as if, I, I might write a historical play, that's true, I could, um, uh, but at the same time, I'm also living now and experiencing things through my lens now. And so, uh, as I said, with setting the table, my new play is set in 2020. I have a question for you, Belina. Mm -hmm. I have right in 2020, uh, this is for Elizabeth also, is your character your age? or is the character much younger? Because this is a dilemma I have a bit in terms of being really able to embody a younger character. You know, it's like, hey, I'm this, I'm this old. So I do a 2020 play and it always features an old man <laughs> who's running around. So I'm kind of curious how you deal with that. Well, I mean, for me, it depends on what story I'm writing, you know, mm -hmm. and I feel, uh, quite cognizant of younger generations because, you know, I have a 24 year old and I have a 34 year old. Mm -hmm. And then uh, every year we have an exchange student from a foreign country and that person is usually 17 or 18 years old. Yeah. So, um, and then my goddaughter who lives in Berlin, you know, she's a younger teenager. And so I see and hear different voices across the spectrum from different generations and they enter into my work too. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I never think of myself as, oh, okay, I won't have anybody over 50 in my play. No, I mean, because that's part of the human experience too. And it, actually it's one uh, minority group in this country that nobody gets to not ever be a part of. So, <laughs> so true. A lot, of my, a lot of my earlier plays were, were, were quote unquote period pieces in the fifties. And I, I, I have often said that hindsight is 2020 and my perspective on, for example, growing up in Texas, in a segregated Texas, my perspective on the 50s as a young boy is no longer tainted by being in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I found that I can write about it from, a, from a, a little more objective and even a more charged subjective uh, perspective uh, in, in 2020, if, if, that, if that makes sense. It does. But I do have a new play about a white man who's about a black man who's passing for white. <laughs> <laughs> um, for me, uh, I write a lot of plays for young audiences, and so uh, I tend to write uh, plays for young people to perform them, um, or younger people than me. Uh, and uh, I guess uh, I like pop culture, so it makes it easier for me to kind of access um, uh, the stuff that they're interested in or in the way they speak. And if I, if I don't know it, then I guess I go find it. But at the same time, I don't want to be mired in um, uh, the lingo of the day. Uh, yeah, so uh, I don't worry about it. If, uh, if I have a character who's young, I just, they, they have a purpose in the play and they pursue that white purpose with a you know, white hot desire and uh, and uh, I try to respect my audiences, the young audiences, um, by, uh, you know, uh, not uh, 
assuming that they don't understand certain difficult subjects. I mean, uh, East West players commissioned me to do Tam Tran Goes to Washington, which is, you know, about undo und undocumented uh, young person. And, um, you know, I never even thought one minute about like, uh, you know, the age disparity for between myself and this character. Um, I just know about how shy she was and thrust into the spotlight she was and, uh, you know, but had to rise to the occasion to uh, speak her truth about her undocumented status and go to Washington and testify just like Mr. Smith goes to Washington. So, so for, in that regard, uh, it doesn't bother me. I am, my latest play that I'm researching and it's my labor of love has to do with uh, Frances Perkins who is uh, the first labor secretary for this country under Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Um, and uh, she, you know, she was older you know, when she was uh, uh, appointed to the cabinet as the first labor secretary, first woman cabinet member. And so it is a period piece. I guess my big kick right now is kind of reclaiming history, um, you know, because a lot of things that we have uh, that we enjoy today, like, um, oh, like fire escapes and the uh, unemployment insurance. And uh, she was uh, among the first in the beginning to work for uh, Medicare. Um, you know, the 40 day work week, um, uh, child labor laws, all you can thank uh, Frances Perkins for her whispering in FDR's ear. So she did it uh, in her time when she was not expected to be forceful and forthright as a woman. Um, she oftentimes took her meals like with the women wives. She didn't take her rightful seat with the other cabinet members. So, you know, how do you work uh, with FDR and be effective? And I think I sort of know, um, and it doesn't have anything to do with sexuality. It has a lot to do with her cl uh, cleverness. And so, um, you know, she managed to, uh, Put notes in his jackets and in his drawers and his desk and at the uh, you know the resolute desk had a lot of notes from her to remind him wherever he went that he should uh, you know work harder to alleviate the suffering uh, fi financial suffering of people. So yes, I am a little bit interested in um, this older lady, uh, but um, that's the the thing that I'm actually working on now researching it. I haven't written a thing, <laughs> but you know, it's, uh, it's, and maybe some people will say, I don't have a right to do that since I'm neither a historian nor, you know, uh, nor a white lady uh, or as, a, or a politician, but uh, too bad. <laughs> I, I, those are my interests. So there you go. A multitude. <laughs> Well, you know, one of the funny things I see in plays written by uh, younger playwrights is they'll have a character who's 55 and really decrepit in the way I might think of somebody in their late 90s. But to them, yeah. that is old, right? So, so that's new. And the other thing that I think about is that as people who are older, we've actually lived through that use. So it is a known entity for us, even though it's different. Whereas the, you know, 20 something person writing a play, uh, they haven't been 55 yet. So, so there isn't, I mean, certainly they can and should authenticate their understanding of that through, through their research, you know, however they choose to do it, but that's funny. And then one other funny thing that happened to me is that uh, this um, young writer, a male who was uh, 37, he said to me, oh my goodness, you're still writing? And I said, yeah, you know, getting hired all the time. And, uh, he said, why? And I said, well, when I started writing, I didn't say to myself, okay, I'll write until I'm 40. And I said, so when do you think people are too old to write? He goes, I don't know, like 45 or so. And I said, well, then you better get busy because you don't have years 45. <laughs> My role model is Keith Richards. So. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we have uh, just a couple minutes left. I'm wondering if folks have um, any um, last minute thoughts, uh, reactions, anything they want to say. You can do kind of a final round before we wrap it up. Well, I'm grateful for all you playwrights who put older men in your plays. <laughs> the actor in me is, anyway. <laughs> this has been rich. Thank you all very much. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I just want to thank uh, East Asian Studies at USC and also East West Players and the Black and Latino Playwright Celebration uh, for presenting this, this talk. But also I want to say to Snehal and Eugene, I want to thank you for being uh, theater makers that are putting work on stage and, and, and supporting the development of new work because you know the, the that's what cultivates the future of the American theater, the future of the yeah. theater in general. So thank you for that. You know, Valina, a friend of mine, a, a mentor of mine, Douglas Turner Ward, passed away this past week, mm -hmm. and I, I I responded to that. That man, that man, uh, I I I I, it's, I may get emotional, but I only hope that I can I that I can serve a few and do for a few what he did for so many, just in terms of nurturing their 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 artistry, just in terms of nurturing their the yeah, it's it's. But yeah, I'll be quiet. No, I, I agree. And he was 101. That's how old he was. And uh, wow. I, he actually produced my play American Dreams in New York back in 84. So I had a chance to have many uh, meaningful chats with him. And um, th the other person that I also want to say that I think has done a lot for intersectionality and in, especially in Black theater, Sidney Poitier. We, we worked together a lot and he came from the Bahamas. And so he had an interesting view of, of Black diversity because of his own roots and coming through, uh, making a place for himself in, in American theater and film, actually internationally really, um, at a time when it just wasn't possible to do that. So I think we're in a really different political time now and we'll see where that takes us. Um, but we always, of course, have a lot of work to do. I was gonna say, Thank we you. can't let up if we can, we just, yeah, yeah. Bam the torpedoes, full speed ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Else. I want to thank, um, yeah, all four of you for being such trailblazers, um, so for being such brave um, artists and for the, you know, the stories and the characters that you've created that have um, impacted our lives and also brought visibility to our experiences. So I wanted to thank you all for that. Um, and I think I'm in a, you know, this past year, like a burn it down phase. So if it's not working for you, tear it down and do something else, make it work for you um, or create something else. Because, you know, some of it is, yes, these structures have been here bearing down on us. And it's, we spend so much time and effort, you know what I mean? On them, focused on them, on that, on becoming the other, um, instead of just moving ourselves directly into the center, so. Thank you, everyone, for this amazing discussion. I was I learned so much, and I'm I'm ex very excited for all the new works coming forth, and um, we will make sure to share it with our community as well. So just keep us updated on everything. So on behalf of the East Asian Studies Center, thank you, everyone, for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you at our next event. Thank you. Thank you, Grace.